well, thank you, Susan, for that introduction. And um, as she said, my name is Tiffany, um, Tiffany Amman. And I have been involved in the living history uh, realm for about four years now. However, I've been a lover of history my whole life. Uh, it's always been something that's interested me. <clears throat> I am, as she said, involved with the Pittsburgh Historical Music Society, Pittsburgh Historical Costume Society. I have done living history demonstrations and um, personas at, and historical personas at several um, at a few different sites, including this one. And Laura and I are also involved in um, a musical group called Wayward Companions. We're doing a, um, we're an 18th century group. And we've been kind of making the, the festival circuit uh, this summer. And uh, we're also, uh, we're planning our, um, our 2019 season as well. And as I said, I've been a long time lover of history. Been doing this for four years. I absolutely love it. In fact, I have a gig after this, <laughs> so I'm pretty busy, so. All right, Laura, do you want to sure. talk a little bit about here? Um, I've been doing this for more like 25 years. Um, my focus has been more on the costuming end of things. That's kind of what I got interested in first. And so that's a lot of the research I do. I started the Costume Society because we all needed excuses to make things. So <laughs> yeah. the yeah. purpose of the organization is to create opportunities to wear the stuff everybody makes. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, we do a lot to popularize events at historical sites and things along that so that people can show up in costumes. So and it's on um, Facebook. It's a Facebook group. If you join it, then, you know, you see posts of events and things that are going to happen in the general area. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how we work. Yes. And then with the music, I also do um, harp. I have historical harps, which is kind of rare for the United States. There aren't many, many people who have them. Mm -hmm. So one of the people I'm going to talk about is a harpist. <laughs> yes. With mm -hmm. that, do you want to start? I'm All right. Going to talk about our own general overview. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to ask you all a question. Okay. So. What was it about this event that piqued your interest? So, um, um, why are you all here? <laughs> my relatives were here, my ancestors were here in the oh. 1700s, and so nice. I just wanted to learn what their life was like. Very cool, yes, absolutely. I think you were raising your hand as well. Oh, um, I guess next year is the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Yeah. And okay. there's like all of these things going on in Pittsburgh. Right. About Women, and you know something that we did, I didn't learn. Yes. Maybe my generation, how important you know women were and how courageous they were, mm -hmm. and it really fills me up and gives me courage. Yes. And just anything that has to do with women anymore, it's just mm -hmm. like I gotta like attend and learn right. more. Oh, awesome! Yeah, yeah, great. And anybody else? Clothing, Clothing costumes. Clothing, costumes. Yeah, that's why we're all here too. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, and so another question. Um, what comes to mind when you think of maybe an 18th century woman or you know, just a woman in history in general? Lots of layers of clothes. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was, sometimes, there was, sometimes there was that, yes. Always being hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes there was that, but not always. Um, Lots of kids. Lots of kids, Lots of yes, kids. because you, you know, you, you know, when a lot Stay of Stay home, are, just take care of the kids. Yeah, they're both hard working. <laughs> hard working. Yeah. All right, yes, yeah, hard working. Um, anybody else? Well, this was still Indian country then. I'm sorry? This was still Indian country then. A lot of it, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so. All right, anybody else? Jane Austen. Jane Austen. <laughs> yeah, we all think of Jane Austen. Mm -hmm. Not many rights. Okay. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. So, all right, now, well, those are all very interesting and very good answers because you know what? A big reason why <coughs> I started getting the idea for this type of a program, I actually, I originally wanted to do it for female docents, female museum docents, because as somebody who has been doing it for a few years now, and Laura's been doing it for several, you know, longer than I have, um, I've often been, charged with helping new docents, kind of mentoring them, uh, trying to steer them in a good direction. 
But one thing that very often just really, really troubled me was when I would hear new female dose and say, well, I'm kind of hesitant because women didn't seem to have that many options. Well, what if I told you that you were wrong? That there were a lot more options than a lot of people think. And some of what you hear today might be a little bit contrary to what is normally put out there. Um, for some reason, the, the media usually only puts out, it's, it's like, a, like a, almost just this one very, very just rigid timeline. And, and I also have a podcast and a blog. And one thing that I often talk about is about how a lot of people tend to think that um, history is just this neat little package. It's just this neat little timeline of events where it was just the dark ages up until a certain point and then maybe the mid 20th century. Everybody just saw the light and everything just skyrocketed and everything started to get better. Well, that's not really how it was. In fact, one thing that I often do in my own historical presentations is to point out that there really isn't a whole lot new under the sun. In fact, a lot of things tend to cycle around again. And the timeline of events, it's more of a wavy line than just this neat little, okay, line down here and then shooting up over here. It was constant back and forth. If anything, it was kind of a jumbled mess. Um, and I know some people, like when they hear about a story today, I know like, because there's always somebody who's gonna say, well, yeah, but I heard that so-and-so over here had a completely different experience. Well, one thing you have to understand too is that also people in the 18th century, they were just as diverse in their thoughts, opinions, political views, everything, as much as we are today, because they were humans, they were people. They weren't robots, <laughs> you know? And, and that's another myth that we often, that those of us in living history try to dispel, is that these were living, breathing human beings that had different ideas, different thoughts. Mary, Mary watch you know, always come in. They weren't just, this big hive mind. And that's one thing that I do love about doing living history and reenactment is that we give that opportunity to people to really see, okay, yeah, these, this, there were actually a lot of different kinds of people that lived back then. And depending on your region, depending on your religion, depending on your social status, everything, your experience might have been completely different from everybody else. In fact, I was watching this one video by James Townsend. I don't know if any of you ever heard of him. If you haven't, check him out. He's awesome. Uh, he does a lot of cool 18th century demonstrations. He even veers off into 19th century a little bit. But one, he, did, he did this one video. I think it's called Digging Deep into History. And one thing that he said is that people even within five miles of each other might have had completely different morals, completely different viewpoints, completely just different ways of viewing the world, depending on their upbringing, their social status, things like that. So when you hear one thing and then you say, well, I heard, but, but I always heard this, that doesn't mean that what you heard was necessarily wrong. It just meant somebody just had a different experience than that other person. So you want anything, Laura? Yeah, sure. Um, one thing I've noticed in looking at a lot of these women who actually did work doing something other than taking care of children and housework is they tended to marry into families that were involved in the same trade. So if your father was a blacksmith, there was a pretty good chance that you were going to marry another blacksmith because they worked, <coughs> the center of the economy was at home. They lived there, they worked there, all of the kids, the women, everybody tended to learn a good bit about this trade. And so you were you had a marketable skill. If your father was a blacksmith and you knew a good bit about being a blacksmith or a tinsmith or a cooper or whatever, they often tended to marry into another, you know, another family that was involved in that same trade. Mm -hmm. Because yes. they didn't really think that romantic love was a great thing to base a marriage on. That's kind mm -hmm. of a modern idea. Yes. And we were a lot more practical about it. It was more like who would fit your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Would it be arranged then? Not necessarily arranged, but you know, when it came time to choose, you would be looking amongst other families that did similar things to you. Mm -hmm. 
you know, a lot of them married the father's apprentices. They get, you know, young guys in to be apprentices and, you know, one thing leads to another and there you go. So, you know, that was the case with a lot of, well, the two ladies that I did research on, you know, had, you know, married into families. And so if the husband died or even became incapacitated, you know, the woman would take the business over. There was no, in the 18th century, women actually had more rights than they did in the 19th century. Because once industrialization took over, and now people <coughs> don't work at home anymore. The guy gets on, you know, a, a train or whatever and goes to a factory to work. That's when this culture began, that, you know, the job of women was to stay home and reflect the family's social status. You know, change clothes ten times a day or whatever. Before that, they were involved in... The, the husband's trade and would probably know it as well as he did. And so if he died, they would take it over. And that's the case that in with one of the women I'm going to talk about. Yes, um, yeah, definitely. And and it's interesting that she brought up the how women apparently had more had more freedoms in the 18th century than they did in the 19th century, basically due to a lot of that was due to the industrialization the industrialization of America, of the world pretty much. And that kind of goes with my whole uh, spiel of when I say how it was more of a wavy line as opposed to this neat little dark age and then suddenly everything shot up. Um, because it was, a lot of it, it was back and forth and a lot of um, roles of women and men as well evolved and changed based upon what was going on in the rest of the world around them. And as far as the role of homemaker goes, that's something that a lot of people tend to scoff at today, I noticed. However, um, the role of homemaker, um, especially in the 18th century, was a lot different than the post-World War II um, definition of a homemaker. Um, the role of a housewife was actually extremely important. It was really nothing to sneeze at. Um, as, as far, I mean, yes, of course, you had to do cooking, washing, taking care of the kids. But as Laura said, you were also very often involved with the business. You were involved with doing, you know, basically helping, you know, the husband run the business. And if he had to go away, I mean, of course she had to take that over. And I was reading one article where the, um, the person writing it was actually stating how very often, even though maybe the husband might have been the face of the business, the woman was very often the, the go-to person because she would be the one kind of knowing all the ins and outs, and especially if the husband would be away, the townspeople would be coming and asking her all the questions. And also, especially if you were a housewife on the frontier, I mean, you also had to know how to defend your home. You had to like, really, really know how to, to ration everything. You, I mean, it was a very, very involved job. And the whole family was involved in the home economy, too. And um, that's another thing, too. A lot of people imagine, oh, the, the nuclear family all throughout history. Well, no. The, the nuclear family actually was kind of an anomaly throughout history that really became pop popularized in the 1950s after World War II. And you know, America was in this economic boom. And people now were embracing this more idyllic lifestyle after basically pretty much generations of war, depression, um, and things that really weren't good to experience. So in a way, when you look at it that way, it's kind of understandable why, at least at first, after World War II, that whole idyllic kind of leave it to beaver lifestyle was kind of embraced, at least at first. You know, so do you have anything to add? Yeah, sure. I mean, house a family at that time was far more expansively defined. It would include the apprentices who were there to learn things, um, servants who lived there full time. Uh, they would have older people, parents, unmarried aunts, widowed uncles, and these people did important things in the in the economy of the family. You know, often the older people would take care of children, so that would enable the younger people to run the business and do all this work because it was a lot more labor intensive. There was no microwaves, <laughs> you know, yes. no washing machines. <laughs> And so all of these things took a lot more labor, and it really wasn't, say, reasonable to have a couple living by themselves in a separate household 
because there was just too much work. If you were a single person or just a couple starting out, you might either live with your own parents or another relative, or you could live in a boarding house where there was it was a business that was run by the woman who was running that boarding house. So, you know, their definition of family was a lot different than ours. It was a lot more expansive. It was usually they would send kids to another household when they got to be around nine or ten years old to learn a trade. They didn't necessarily keep them all at home until they were, you know, 18 years old and then they went off on their own. They were often sent out to become apprentices or sent to another woman's house to learn how to become a seamstress or, you know, you were sent to somebody else's house to finish raising you. Um, and that, people now think that's really weird, but that was considered normal back then. Yes, so the whole definition of family was completely different than how we perceive it today. And another thing that women did, especially if you were married to a soldier, and it was during a time of war, like say the Korean War. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> for that. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Well, anyway, I don't know. Maybe John Neville doesn't want to sing his family tree. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, all right. So, but another thing that a woman did, especially if you were a camp fault if you were a the wife of a soldier, like say during the French and Indian War, the um, Revolutionary War, um, you know, uh, there were a few others as well. Um, if you were the wife of a soldier, you, you usually would take on the role of a camp follower. Now, what do you think a camp follower is? Anybody? Yes. I'm guessing. Um, you would go and and clean for the soldiers? And yes, so, yeah, and... very close, yes, absolutely. So if you were married to a soldier, um, you would be a camp follower, and those women actually contrib contributed greatly to the war effort. That's another misconception that I run into with a lot of people, is that they're surprised when they learn about the, the great contribution um, to war efforts that women have been making for centuries. A lot of people seem to think that that just started during World War II, and it, and it doesn't. Even if you look up World War I, I mean, women were still working in the factories. The Civil War, you know, women were taking over the jobs that, you know, the men had to leave, especially, and this was exactly why, too, the woman also had to know her husband's trade, if something like that were to happen. But, um, but camp followers, as I said, were often married to a soldier. They would cook, clean, uh, sew, they were laundresses. They pretty much did everything to keep the army as much intact as possible. And basically they were allowed in limited numbers depending on the unit, depending on the officer. Um, and also a lot of them would have traveled, um, maybe traveled from Europe or they, they could have been local. And there were also a lot of um, female sutlers as well who um, they would sell things like soap, whiskey, any pretty, and the fabric, pretty much anything that they could get their hands on that maybe a camp follower or even a soldier could purchase from them. And these female, these women sutlers, they very often followed the military units as well. And if Laura wants to add something. Sure, they generally, they, a lot of people think, you know, they were prostitutes. They really did not encourage that. In fact, if the guy died, you had a certain amount of time to marry somebody else or they kicked you out. Oh. They, they did not really have single women doing that. They didn't. Yeah. But it was a distraction for these guys to have that. So, you know, you had a certain amount of time, a few weeks, you marry another guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could you imagine all these testosterone filled guys and looking at that, oh, single woman, you know? But, um, but yes, but that's um, basically a camp follower played a very, very important role. And that's why if you go to a lot of reenactment um, events, you see the, a lot of the military encampments, you see the soldiers, and you also see a lot of women there. And a lot of those women are portraying the camp followers. And, or maybe even a, a woman sutler who is um, following the camp. And one particular British camp follower is actually, and if you're getting into reenacting, um, camp followers can actually be very, very interesting characters to, to research and try to portray. Uh, one in particular I have here, her name is uh, Martha May, 
And she is mentioned in the papers of um, Henry Bouquet, who was a very, very prominent figure uh, during the Seven Year War. And um, she, she basically, she was arrested for accosting an officer, a military officer. <laughs> and placed in car and she was placed in Carlisle jail. I don't know too much beyond that, but I think it would be interesting to research that and see exactly who she was and you know things like you know see exactly who she was, what her background was, where she came from. Um, but I found that little piece of information like you know kind of interesting but but that's the thing like when you really start, um, looking at these people more as individuals instead of okay, yeah, just these you know this mass hive mind, you'll see that there are quite a bit of just really, really interesting people who, you know, just have these really, really cool ideas, you know, and, you know, some of which might be even a lot more modern than you might think. And, you know, do you have anything on that? Or? Well, yeah, I, I would like to know what he did that Susan <laughs> felt him when he took him. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, yeah. He must have been pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, especially if she accosted him enough to land herself yeah. in jail, you know, so. Uh, but yes, but that was, um, <laughs> but that was, um, one of, you know, one of the jobs that women had was camp follower as well as um, a sutler that followed the army. However, there were also more, I guess you can say conventional jobs that, um, that, that women had. Um, you know, and as we mentioned, um, women would often um, marry into the, uh, the the family that had that had their same trade, so that because you know just basically out of practicality, and some of these occupations included blacksmith, tavern owners, printers, postmasters, mediums, actresses, singers, musicians, composers, midwives, school teachers. I mean, you know, women held a lot of different positions that people don't even think about. And I've portrayed a, um, a school marm before. And you know, one interesting note that I found was that as a school marm, you could not get married. Or even as a schoolmaster, you could not get married. So whether you were a man or a woman teaching, you could not get married. Basically because, as we stated before, taking care of a home and a family was a lot more labor intensive and it required a lot more time than it does today. And it's not like today where, you know, we have all this modern technology and the teachers can, you know, do their thing and then have their lives. It's like, no, your life had to be the school and those kids and making sure that when those kids were in your care that you were completely 100% present. You weren't worrying about, you know, did, you know, did the cows escape or something? Or you weren't worried about, oh no, is my family at home being, you know, being attacked or whatever? Um, you couldn't be worrying about that. You had to be completely present and in the school. And, you know, and so therefore that's why, because I had always heard that women teaching couldn't get married, but I wasn't sure about men teaching. Um, but same went for both of them apparently, I found out recently, was that if you were, whether you're a man or a woman teaching, you could not get married, and if you wanted to get married, you couldn't teach anymore, you had to find a new occupation. And, um, and I know Laura has a very fascinating story about a harvest, since we're both in music, you know? We, <laughs> uh, we, figured we should include one, all right. Again, these folks lived in Europe, um, but it, in some ways it's easier to find information on the people that were living in Europe that time because there's not a lot of written records going on here. But there were certainly people here doing the same thing, right? And, the, and this lady's name was Sophia Dusik. And she was born in 1775 and was a Scottish singer, pianist, harpist, and composer of Italian descent. So she had a lot of training. She was born into a, her maiden name was Corey. She studied voice with her father, who was a uh, <laughs> John Neville is just not having that today. So again, she was born into a musical family. Her father taught her how to sing, how to play these musical instruments. So she was moved to London in 1788, and she married a harpist named John Ludus um, Dusik. And he's pretty well known because he was a composer. Um, and she was also a composer. Right? And um, you can find her stuff online and learn it. And so she was involved with Mozart, 
She had her London debut in 1799 with Haydn, and she was also involved in the London premiere of Mozart's Requiem, which wow. you know, a lot of us are familiar, especially if we saw that movie. <laughs> So after Dusick died in 1812, she married a viola player, and they lived in Paddington and established a music school there. And I think she died in 1831. And I was able to find a picture of her, which I will blow up and hold up. to me and one thing that I wanted to do was at some of these events 
I was like, hey, why not portray an 18th century opera singer? And, you know, I could sing to people and, you know, <laughs> but um, serenade them as they walk by. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but her name is Charlotte French. She was a, ch a child prodigy. She grew up in, basically her whole family was in the entertainment industry. And we're going to get more into uh, women in entertainment a little, in, you know, just a little bit too. And, um, you know, her whole family was in the entertainment industry. And like I said, she was a child prodigy. She, um, her, her father actually uh, made sure she had the best schooling. And she went on to be one, a very world-renowned opera singer in the 18th century. And I'm doing research on her so that I should, because she's one person I would love to portray. And, um, and in fact, I'd love to do a whole presentation, honestly, on um, both male and female opera singers in the 18th century. I think that would be really cool. But, uh, but that's another, uh, you know, another figure who was very, very prominent in the music scene back in the 18th century. Now, another person I'm going to talk about, who here has heard of Mary Catherine Goddard? Nobody. Well, that's a problem. And I'm going to remedy that. <laughs> I'm going to remedy that for you today. She was an early American publisher, a bookseller, and the postmaster of the Baltimore Post Office from 1775 to 1789. And she was the first female postmaster in America. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. She was also the second printer to print the Declaration of Independence. And her copy was one of the first to include the signatories, including John Hancock's. And her father, Giles, was also a postmaster, so it kind of goes with the whole learning your family's trade. And her mother, Sarah, was an American printer and a co-founder and publisher of the Providence Gazette and Country Journal, which was the first newspaper founded in Providence, Rhode Island. Yes. <laughs> Interrupting! Oh my goodness! <laughs> All right, Dan. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, she that was it was the first newspaper founded in Providence, Rhode Island, and that was founded by her mother, Sarah. And Sarah worked closely with her son William and her daughter Mary Catherine, and both. William and Mary Catherine also became printers and publishers, um, forming one of the earliest influential publishing dynasties in the American colonies. So the Goddards were pretty well known for their printing. And she also involved herself with local politics, especially when it concerned the postal service. And Goddard was a successful postmaster for 14 years from 1775 to 1789. And this is where it might get a little bit cringe. In 1789, she was removed from the position of Postmaster General but by Postmaster General Samuel Osgood, despite general protest from the Baltimore community. Because well, Osgood um, basically, it was she he thought it was more traveling than a woman could undertake. But the community was basically like, wait a minute, she's been doing it for 14 years. You know, <laughs> apparently she could handle it and. While Goddard, she, she preferred to not take, um, take part in public controversies. I'm sure if she would have asserted herself, she probably would have been able to keep her position, especially since she had so much support and people petitioning for her. And one per petition included the signatures of 200 businessmen in the Baltimore wow. area. So you, you know you can see like how highly people thought of her, and you know except for this you know Samuel Osgood dude, you know. But you know, but she, I mean, but she basically, but even though she didn't get her position reinstated, she still lived out the rest of her days beloved by her community, and she was still a very popular bookseller, and you know she sold all sort, you know her store was you know pretty popular up until and pretty successful up until her death. And another woman involved in the printing, it, the printing industry was Clementina Rind, who took over running her family's uh, printing press after her husband passed away. And because she ran it together with her husband, and then when he passed away, she had to take it over. She had to provide for her children, things like that. And Colonial Williamsburg, if you go to their website, they actually have an interesting little podcast on the woman who portrays Clementina Rind out there. And Basically, um, they asked her, well, would she have been accepted by society as a female businesswoman? And, you know, she says, you know, 
if anything, she would have been accepted from a legal standpoint, at least. You know, and if and honestly, as you you know, saw with Mary Catherine Goddard, if you do your job and do it well, at the end of the day, people don't care, you know, whether you're a man or a woman. If you can do your job, you can do your job. I mean, you know, there's plenty of men who proved incompetent. All I mean, you look at all throughout history, there were plenty of successful men and men who proved incompetent too and lost everything and the respect of their community and everything, you know, all that. So I think at the end of the day, you know, even if there might have been some gender politics in place, at the end of the day, all pe especially when survival is key. Mm -hmm. People, I mean, all people care about is you can do your, is, is you can do your, can you do your job? You know, and you want to have add anything to that or? I remember reading somewhere in colonial America in the 18th century, at least the smaller communities were largely run by middle-aged women because Darwin's law was a lot harder on men in those days than on women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we keep saying over and over again, well, once her husband died, she took over the business. Well, I mean, a lot of women still died in childbirth, and in the 18th century, it was one in eight. But if you survive the first one, you had a good chance of surviving the rest of them. And But the men often had dangerous professions. They got sucked into military duty and got killed off. It was all, the men were a lot less likely to survive until middle age and old and age than the women. And so, hmm. kind of like it still is now when you start talking about people in their 80s and 90s, there are a whole lot more older women around than older men. And so in a lot of these communities, the elders that kind of oversaw everything were the women. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. And um, a couple other, um, I'm gonna read off a couple other uh, key, um, key figures. Unfortunately, I mean, I wish we could list all of them because there are just so many, but we had to, we only have so much time, so we had to kind of narrow it down. Maybe we'll do a part two? I don't know. But, <laughs> okay, but, but besides Clementina Rind, there was also Deborah Franklin, and anybody can guess who Deborah Franklin was. Deborah Franklin's much maligned, abandoned wife. Yes, okay. <laughs> but, De yeah, she was Ben Franklin's um, common, common law wife, um, and she ran his businesses successfully while he was away in Europe. And then there was also Charlotte Brown. She was a widow and matron of Braddock's army. And she sailed to America with her brother from England. And she also kept a diary, which is, from what I hear, <clears throat> is a must read. And, um, sorry, I'm losing my voice. But <laughs> I hope not, because I have to sing later. But, <laughs> you know. but, um, but yeah, but she was, um, but yeah, but she kept a diary. And that's one, it's one thing I definitely plan to get my hands on and read. She was in charge of all the nurses and actually met with uh, Deborah Franklin on her trip to um, trip to North Albany, uh, North to Albany, and um, there's also a book apparently on her life coming out too, in addition to her diary. So Charlotte Brown, I'd say, look her up, look up her diary, you know, and watch for the book that's coming out. Sarah Campbell Knight, she's somebody whose diary or journal I actually have. Now this is this is fragmented because some portions of the diary and journal were destroyed or lost. But, uh, but she, she was a teacher and a businesswoman. And she, and this journal that she kept basically chronicles her journey from Boston to New York. Now, why was she traveling from Boston to New York? Well, she, at the time she was, you know, 38 years old, married, and she was also keeper of a boarding house. And in Boston, she also had some experience as a copier of legal documents. And she was on her way to New Haven and then later to New York City to act on behalf of a friend in the settlement of her deceased husband's estate. And this is actually a very, very fascinating read. And I've actually, I've used her journal to create my own um, personas as well, because especially if my persona, uh, you know, for that particular cyber event is a traveler, this gives you some real insight into what all, if whether you are man or woman, if you were traveling, what all you would go through, like having to stay in taverns. And some taverns were really, really nice, while others weren't so nice, you know? And whether, and it didn't really matter um, who you were as far as the taverns went. It's like, basically, if all they had was a bowl of stew to give you, that's what you ate. 
and wherever they had, you know, they had to sleep, that's where you slept. And and Sarah Kemble Knight is um, <laughs> there's there's one account where she's t talking about how she couldn't she couldn't sleep because in the next room these two men were going on and on about something political and she was like I want to join their conversation but I also have to sleep so I can get to you know get back on the road again but she but she's also another um, interesting woman and I would say it's it's the the journal of Madame Knight I would say definitely check this out and like I said it's a little bit it might be a little bit of a confusing read because some some of the parts are fragmented because there are missing pages but like I said Unfortunately, some of the older documents, they, you know, they get lost or some of them, so you can only piece together what you can get, but she's another one. And also, um, Abigail Adams, uh, she was also, while um, her husband John was in, John Adams was in Philadelphia, um, help, you know, with putting, helping with putting together the Declaration of Independence, um, she was caring for the family on their farm and like just taking care of business and making sure that, you know, things, you know, things kept running. And um, do you have any others you want to add? Sure, I, I thought of one while we were sitting here talking, and I, you would really like this lady, and you should probably consider doing her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ooh. I know there's a picture of her, like, her name was Anna Bishop. Okay. And she's more of a 19th century chick. Okay. But, you know, she started <laughs> out in the early 19th century, and when I pull her up, there's her picture. I she was an opera singer in the 19th century. Oh. In the 19th century. She right. was born in 1810. Come on. And this is a picture of her. I can pull off her look. I <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we tend to think of them all as being like a uh, real uh, straight laced and morally upright. Mm -hmm. Well, she took lessons and studied with Henry Clay Bishop, who wrote songs like Home Sweet Home mm -hmm. and things that everybody would know now. And she eventually married him. And he also had an orchestra. And so eventually he hired himself a new harpist. And this guy, his name was Bosha. And Bosha had come from France. And he was a he's a very famous harp composer. You can you can still buy his music. Like his methods, his little etudes and things, the harp teachers now still use them. They're really, really good. But he was kind of a character. He had a wife in France. He had been he had to leave France in a big hurry because he was guilty of some sort of financial crime like embezzlement. And they were gonna nab him and they were gonna put him in jail. So he fled to London. And he got hired by the Paris Conservatory there for a while. But when they found out that in France they were going to put him in prison, they, they fired him. <laughs> but Henry, Henry Clay Bishop hired him to be harpist for his orchestra. And so after, after a while of being acquainted, Anna Marie Bishop and Bosha ran away. <laughs> and he went all over Europe, but not France, <laughs> giving concerts and things. All right, yes. And she apparently she had a number of children that she left behind with Henry. Oh Bishop. my gosh! Okay. And eventually, when they ended up in Australia, Bosha got sick and he died there. And there's this big, elaborate tombstone of a weeping woman that she had erected for him. But you know, by this time, the first husband had died, so she married a diamond merchant, moved to New York. <laughs> <laughs> she continued singing opera. She sang, you know, up into her eighties. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So, I'll have to look into her. And she's a character. I really like her. <laughs> <laughs> she did all kind of things that you don't think women would have done back then. Exactly. And another one, woman, speaking of women who were, you know, real characters back then, especially in the entertainment world, um, has, any, has anybody ever heard of Mary Robinson? Has anybody ever heard of Beyonce? Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody's heard of Beyonce. Well, Mary Robinson was pretty much the 18th century answer to Beyonce. Um, she, uh, she, she was an 18th century actress, poet, a dramatist and celebrity figure. And she was born in 1757 and died in 1800. Her nickname was Perdita because she was known, she was best known for playing the role of Perdita in Shakespeare's A Winter's Tale. In fact, she got her big break playing Juliet in Romeo and Juliet, um, her big break in acting. 
And while she was the 18th century's um, answer to Beyonce, her husband was hardly the 18th century answer <laughs> to Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. at, at least at least successful wise. I mean her her husband was, you know, basically not very respectable at all. And while he was in prison, she actually penned her first book of poems to pretty to help, you know, basically support herself, you know, try to support him and pay off his debts, because he was in prison for debt, pay off his debt, debts and get him out of prison. Um, well, at that point along the way, she kind of slowly, she built herself up, and she was, you know, she was known as an actress. And then later on, she kind of wanted to leave that behind, so she turned to, back to her writing. Now, one interesting of note with her is that she was, a lot of things that I've read about her was that she was one of those very sexualized female celebrities. And one thing that's interesting, when I was reading about <clears throat> how the public received her, it's really, like if you look at how people viewed, you know, Jean Harlow in the 1930s, or, you know, Marilyn Monroe or Jane Mansfield in the 50s, or Britney Spears or Christina Aguilera in like the late 90s, early 2000s, and now I think it's like Ariana Grande or somebody. When you look at, you know, all those women and including uh, Mary Robinson, you see very interesting parallels. Because as with Mary Robinson, as it was with Jean Harlow, Marilyn Monroe, Jane Mansfield, Britney Spears, Ariana Grande, um, People either really, really love them, love what they're about, love what they represent, love what they have to say, or they think they're just the most repulsive person in the world. Well, that's how it was with Mary Robinson. And it kind of goes with my whole um, spiel that I typically give whenever I talk about history, is that there really is not a whole lot new under the sun. In fact, a lot of the stuff kind of cycles back around again. And, you know, and it's really, really interesting when I read about these people who were seen as celebrity figures and how they were viewed by the public and then looking at how we view certain celebrity figures today. It's really, it's almost the same. And it's almost like human nature doesn't really change. You know, and I know some people might find that troubling, but, you know, but that's, but that's the reason why like we have history is we can look at that and just be like, okay, well here are some parallels, okay, here's where we've learned, you know, and, and that is how you can really use history as a tool for how you should evolve and how you should progress. And uh, do you have anything to add there? No, I think that's great. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. But yes, but, um, but I, I really, I, you know, found um, Mary Robinson, that's why I found her a particular person of interest because like Laura said, we typically think of these women as like very buttoned up and they never talked or said anything or, you know, and well, you know, I mean, yeah, that was there, that was there for some people, but like I said in the beginning, you know, you have, I mean, his, it, people were just as diverse back then in their lives and their way of thinking, their political views as they are today. And you know, and as far as political views go, there I mean there were also a lot of women in politics too. Um, it w wasn't as much as there is today, but they, they, it was still there. For instance, um, Penelope Barker. She was quite political during the American Revolution. Um, I don't know if anybody ever heard of the Edenton Tea Party. Everybody's heard of the Boston Tea Party, but um, but Penelope Barker organized the Edenton Tea Party in Edenton, Eden, Edenton, or Edenton, I don't know, North Carolina, um, which was comprised entirely of women. 51 women, and that included Penelope Barker. And women were very significant in running the household. And because of that, they were often very, very crucial in political movements, especially when it came to boycotting, boycotting the tea. And because you know they were so crucial in you know in running the household, they were the ones like you know kind of rationing, deciding what the family bought, what they didn't buy, and they also I mean because of that they also one thing I like to get into over here is how you know they were also kind of influential in that sense in the fashion industry because a woman getting ready in the morning was also I mean it was a production, it wasn't uncommon for her to have visitors while she was 
getting dressed and putting on her makeup. And today we might find that a bit like, wait, what? You know, and including gentlemen callers too. I mean, there are several historical pictures and paintings of how of, that shows a woman getting ready. Um, she's at her vanity stand, and there's a, a man, a guy, just sitting there talking to her like it's nothing. You know, because they didn't have the sense of privacy that we do today. <laughs> yeah. Or they didn't have Instagram and Facebook. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Everybody does the same thing like that with. Uh huh. Yeah. Here's yeah. a picture of my breakfast. Exactly. <laughs> actually commented on, well, that's not any different than somebody watching reality TV and watching the Kardashians get ready on their show. And I'm like, you know what, that's absolutely true, because they had their Kardashians back then. They had their people who were just famous for looking good and not much else, you know. And, um, you know, and then they also, like I said, then they had their women in business and politics in entertainment. And, you know, another one is Nancy Morgan Hart, who was a frontier woman. And um, she, you know, she basically outsmarted Tory soldiers. Some of her stuff, like some of the stuff out there on her, is a bit iffy because some of their, some of it's like myth, myth and folklore, and others are true. But so you kind of have to be discerning when you read stuff about her. But she's still an interesting person to read about. Flora McDonald, who I love talking about, she was instrumental in the Jacobite uprising in Scotland. I love talking about her. She helped the Bonnie Prince escape from prison. And when the soldiers, the when the, the men that they were traveling with, um, and they, they, she managed to successfully sneak them out. But they were accosted later, and um, the the two the two other men that they were traveling with, they. They were, they, were, they were questioned, and that's how they found, they found out about Flora McDonald and the Prince and all that stuff. But she was released from prison um, during the um, Act of Indemnity of 1747. And she was another one who was beloved by her community. Uh, she gained a lot of sympathy for her courage. And you know she was known as the heroine of the Jacobite uprising. And, once again, kind of bringing light to a fact that at the end of the day, even if there might have been some gender politics and issues, at the end of the day, people are more concerned with can you do your job right than, um, than they are with, you know, well, yeah, you can do your job right, but sorry, you're, you're a woman, but so, so, unless, you know, unless, of course, you're Samuel Osgood with Mary mm -hmm. Catherine Goddard, but, mm -hmm. but for the most part, like, but for, to a large degree, people seemed like, if you do your job right, or you do something cool or that we think is really cool and courageous, we're going to give you props. <laughs> you know? And then what comment? Um, I have a friend in Virginia whose family has, over the, the centuries, collected these porcelain dolls that were used to sell dresses. Mm -hmm. And so, like every season, the spring and fall season, there would be like 10 new dresses mm -hmm. and they would dress up the dolls and the dresses and they would go from house to house mm -hmm. and people would place orders and then they would deliver the dresses. So I thought that, I ne never knew about that, but mm -hmm. I thought it was really fascinating and they have a lot of clothing too. That yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are, I've awesome. seen those. They're very, very cool. Because mm -hmm. they didn't really have women's magazines until towards the end of the era. And then it changed, and the fashions were in these women's magazines. Yeah. Before mm -hmm. that, the dolls, they would actually come from France. You know, yes, and, they were all from France. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so do you have anything you want to add before? I, I did think of one other lady, and you can actually find out about her if you go on Netflix. If you look up the series Turn, Washington mm -hmm. Spies, mm -hmm. you will watch a lot about Peggy Arnold, mm -hmm. who you know recently people started paying attention to when she pretty much manipulated mm -hmm. Benedict Arnold mm -hmm. into his whole traitor act. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, there are letters written by her mm -hmm. that people mm -hmm. yeah. ignored, you know, and now lately I've had researched and there's you know novels, she's on that show. Mm -hmm. had an enormous impact on American history. Oh, absolutely. And the thing, and you know, and you know, what I'm going to conclude with, and of course, if you have any questions, you can always um, ask me too after you know after my little conclusion spiel. But um, but as I said in the beginning, a big reason why I wanted to put together something like this specifically for women was the fact that I was actually very troubled when I found new female docents 
um, very, very hesitant to get involved because they didn't think women had that many options. And they're often shocked when I tell them just how many great figures there are, just how much, you know, even if you want to portray somebody, you want to make up your own persona, you know, because, you know, you don't necessarily, I mean, when you're in reenacting, you don't necessarily have to, re you know, reenact a specific person. You can make up your own persona. However, you know, just looking at the different characters, you can, like, very easily come up with your own. And, you know, and, and they were often shocked with just how much women did and just how much they were involved. And, you know, and like I said, I, I just... It just really, really bothers me too, like, you know, especially when I am, I mean, and on the one hand, I'm happy to bring this information to people, but on the other hand, you know, even when I'm giving a history tour, you know, whether it's here or some, you know, or somewhere else, and, you know, and I would tell them about, you know, just like the different things that women did, and they were shocked. You know, they and they haven't even heard of like half the women we talked about, and we haven't even touched on, I mean, what we had talked about today was just a chip off the iceberg. Like I said, it was, I was, I mean, I don't know about you, but I was having trouble, like, narrowing it down. Okay, who are we going to talk about? Because there's just so many different ones. Like I said, we might have to do a part two or something. I don't know. But, like, um, but here's the thing. Like, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm just sitting, like, thinking to myself, this really shouldn't be that shocking. And why is it shocking? And, you know, I think it's a couple of things. I think it's the narrative that's typically put out there. And like I said, I'm not completely dissing it and I understand that that was life for some women and I understand the message that they're trying to convey I understand what they're trying to do but at the same time when you only go by the one narrative that women just stayed home had babies and did nothing else well you're not going to think I mean are you going to think to say go to a history site watch the female blacksmith in action and know that what you're seeing is historically accurate hmm. I mean, because even um, on that same Colonial, Will that, uh, Colonial Williamsburg podcast, um, there's a, a, an article that accompanies it. And several women that work there as blacksmiths, tinsmiths, um, printers, um, the, you know, and it's historically accurate, they've actually said that they've had people come in to say the tinsmith shop, see a woman in there. And these are women doing this, you know, women you know, coming into this tinsmith shop, seeing a woman there, and being like, oh, I guess the tinsmith's not in today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then they're, they're just like, um, hello, no, I am the tinsmith. And they're like, really, you know, really? Wow, you know? And I'm just, and, and that, that I think was what really like made me like, you know, it shouldn't be that way. You know, you should be able to go into a living history site, see a female blacksmith, see a female printer, see a female postmaster, whatever, and know that what you're seeing is historically accurate. It's not just some equal opportunity clause on the museum's part, you know? And that's what really, I think, kind of got my juices going for something like this. And I don't know if Laura wants to conclude with anything. No, I think they're I really ready to. I just have one comment. Yes. And it was one of the participants when you asked, why did you come? And I don't know which of the participants it is, said it, next year is the 100th anniversary mm -hmm. of suffrage. Yes. Mm -hmm. What you may not realize is women actually had a really huge influence in the vote long before we got the vote. And it has to do with baking. Ha, <laughs> interesting. Say more. Yes. <laughs> it has to do with baking. Because cake was a very labor-intensive item to make, and it wasn't something that got made every day. Like, a lot of times we'll have cake after coffee or whatever. It was something that was made for a special occasion. Usually it was made for elections. So what they would do is they would take these enormous pans, and they would turn them every couple of hours, because they're sitting in front of the fire, and turn them and turn them and turn them. And if you made a really good election cake, you would bargain with somebody. Mm -hmm. Well, if you vote for my candidate, you can have a piece of my cake. So if you were a really skilled baker, you could damn, damn darn well influence the vote. You had your, it was a backdoor manipulation. Uh -huh. We weren't voting yet, but we had our claws into the hooks of that. So. Uh -huh. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Well, like I said, well, even with boycotting and a lot of political Which it goes stuff to going on, yes, yes. Exactly. I mean, even if they weren't, 
even if they weren't physically in the trenches, they were still influencing what was going on, you know? So, you know, and that's what I want people to understand is that they did have a lot more influence than we tend to think that they did. And I don't know, maybe you should do our next women's presentation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, I want, all I want to say is if you're done, please take some extra yes. food with you because I, I overbaked, but please take some food with you. We would love, and, and you're, you're more than welcome to come, come visit the museum. Please, totally please, please go visit the house. Totally unrelated to the politics of the day. Uh -huh. Please explain the different styles of your costumes because yours is much more formal looking and yours looks what, what I think like a serpent right there. And I want to know what those loops are for. I okay, well, I, I just kind of dressed as, you know, some like so woman who is a silversmith like dress. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of a basic jacket and okay. skirt combination that, you know, is a little more practical than a great big enormous fancy mm -hmm. gown. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yet they could be a little bit fashionable. They wore fashionable hairstyles and big poofy caps mm -hmm. or were, you know, and had silk ribbons to decorate their outfits even if the outfits were linen or wool. Okay, what are the loops for on your shirt? Um I don't I actually don't have any skirt supports on. There's an isn't there a loop on the side there's on both sides, or are those, are those pockets? Are those for your, for your pockets? pockets? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. so, so, like <laughs> <laughs> so you can reach okay. in there. Their pockets okay. weren't sewn into the clothing. You wore them around your waist. Mm -hmm. So if you've heard that news, that nursery rhyme about Lucy lost, it, lock it, lost her pocket. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's just to yeah. you know reach in and get your pocket. Okay. Right. Well, yes. Yeah, so this is a little bit more 19th century. Mm -hmm. However, um, there was more formal wear, obviously, for uh, women in the 18th century. Um, we're doing women in the 18th century and touching a little bit on other eras too. So you know, and because my my gig coming up is a little bit more 19th century, mm -hmm. I wore this instead. Um, however, um, you know. A lot of, there's also a lot of misconception about women's clothing too. Um, a lot of people, and I went to, you know, we performed at Fort Henry Days um, a couple weekends ago, and this one, um, this one girl, Kara uh, Gordon, she does really, really excellent seamstress work. And she did a presentation on um, 18th century attire. And she um, basically said, when a lot of people had these huge misconceptions about women's clothing, especially the stays. Now, the stays are what most people might call a corset. But even with, because you know you hear about how, oh, they were so disfiguring and all that stuff. Well, I wear stays all the time. I sing in them, I dance in them, I perform in them, and I've never passed out. So one thing that she said was to, when you think about that, you need to get Scarlett O'Hara out of your mind. <laughs> you know? yeah, they did not lace them that tightly. No. It seems more like a bra. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the one thing about stays, too, was that, you know, when you first wore them, you did have to break into them. So they're kind of like a pair of shoes. Like when you get a new pair of shoes, you kind of have to break into them, and then they mold to your feet. Or st well, stays were the same way. And a lot of them, you know, yes, some of more, a more upper class lady might lace them a little bit tighter just because she doesn't have, you know, doesn't really have to work if she doesn't want to. However, working women also wore stays and they served as a back brace almost. Um, and the, one, the only range of motion that you really could, can't do in stays is bend over like this. You're kind of, you're forced to pick things up like this, which that's how you're supposed to pick things up anyway, ideally. So, but more for, but this would have been um, something more, a little bit more formal. I'm not wearing the hoops underneath it right now. I'm going to put that on at my gig because hoops just would not have been easy to maneuver in this little space. But, um, but yes, but there was um, formal wear also for 18th century women. They did not wear hoops though. They wore bum rolls in order to kind of get that, you know, that little hourglass mm -hmm. thing going on that's been popular since the beginning of time. Um, for evolutionary purposes, you know, but um, <clears throat> but yes, but this is what um, like you know something like in the 19th century, <clears throat> a lady would have worn with a hoop skirt, you know, something you know not super formal, but if she wanted to look nice going on her day out. Mm -hmm. But even in the 19th century, if you were a working woman, you didn't bother with hoops. <laughs> you know? I was going to so, ask you that. You know, mm -hmm. Yeah, if you were a working Cooking woman, at home or oh, oh, hoops would have been like, that would not have been practical mm -hmm. at all. Especially around yeah. 
fire. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That, in a way, 18th century clothing was a lot more practical. Well, and then yeah. the other nice thing about wool is it's harder to catch it on fire. Mm -hmm. Do you, when you make your costumes, you have to hand sew them? We do. Some people Some do. I, I only hand sew the parts of the show because mm -hmm. I like to finish them before I die of old age. Yes. Any more questions? Or all right. Well, thank you, ladies, for coming um, and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank, thank you very much. much. Or just for coming. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, no. I'm glad you came because you know, you know the, you know. It's, it's a good to have a combination of men and women in here, like here in these things. So, yes, but thank you so much for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you got something out of it. And if you're planning on maybe getting into living history and reenacting, maybe we gave you some ideas. Maybe you won't be as discouraged, you know, like I've seen so many people be. So, well, just yes,